Grace and peace to you, my friends. Uh, welcome to this service of worship uh, here this morning. Uh, you know, I realize that normally when I say the announcements, I always say, you know, welcome to this service of worship here at Cedar Heights Community Presbyterian Church, but that's, that's really inaccurate. It's really a service of Cedar Heights Community Presbyterian Church. Never have we been more aware uh, than we are these times, perhaps, that the church uh, is not a building. Uh, the church is a people, the church is a community, and we are so glad that you are with us in whatever manner you are. This is how we are going to be worshiping for the next uh, few weeks or so, this online way of worship. You, if you're tuning in right now, then congratulations! <laughs> You've done it right! Uh, these links will be on Facebook and also on our YouTube channel, and you can also find the link on our website as well. So. Uh, thank you so much, my friends, for joining us uh, this day. You know, and I'm also reminded of our, our forebears, uh, the Israelites. After, after their exile, they kept asking the question, how, how can we possibly worship God without a temple? How can we do that? And God's word to them in prophet after prophet is that God is not confined to a building with four walls, but that you can worship God wherever you, wherever you are. So thank you for worshiping with us today, my friends. I pray that you would receive these words here as a call to worship. Our good shepherd calls us together today. No matter how shadowy the valley or uncertain the terrain, God walks with us. We will not fear. We will worship wherever we are, however we can, united in Christ, no matter our physical distance. In joy, in hope, in courage, let us come together and worship God. And we do so first by coming to God for a time of confession this morning. I want us to go to God in silent personal confession today, thinking about the things that we so often take for granted in this world. The ability, for example, uh, to worship in person. I know that I have been taking that very much for granted for a long time. I was on Facebook the other day and I saw a friend whose post said basically, I miss hugs. I miss hugs. And friends, let us go to God in silent personal reflection and just consider all of the things that God blesses us with, all of those things that we have taken for granted for far too long. Let us go to God together in prayer. forgiven. Thanks be to God. And now grounded in grace, let us celebrate the peace we have received in Jesus Christ by sharing it with one another wherever you are. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you.
As we come before God this day, let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. O God of every land and language, every place and people, wherever we may be, wherever we may tune to hear the news of the day, help us to be particularly attuned to your news to us this day and every day. Help us to hear in your word words of comfort, hope, strength, and peace. For we ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Appropriately enough, on this the fourth Sunday in Lent, our scripture reading is a story of healing. It is from John, the ninth chapter. It's a relatively lengthy reading, so Johnny and I have divided it up. It includes multiple parts, uh, Jesus, the man born blind, his parents, the rabbis, the crowd, the disciples. Johnny will be the Pharisees, the disciples, the crowd. And I'm not sure if you're the parents or not, but Johnny's going to be uh, multiple, multiple personalities in this reading. So listen for God's word from John, the ninth chapter, as Johnny and I share it together. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When Jesus had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man, but they kept asking him. Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He's of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. 
Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here's the astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he listens to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been said that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Here ends our reading of God's holy word. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We live next door to a family with four young children. They are in our front yard a lot. They love riding their bikes round and round in our circular driveway. And they like to talk. They have lots and lots of questions. Why? What? How? That seems to be true of all young children. I remember that with my four kids as well. But it's not just kids, is it? We too have lots and lots of questions. We may not voice them with the persistence of a three-year-old, but we have questions, lots of them, especially now. As we face this pandemic, we have four, far more questions than we have answers. We have how questions, especially how long questions. We have when questions, especially about testing and when it will be available. We have what questions, like what should I be looking for and what can I do? We also have who questions. Who should we listen to? Especially given the mixed and muddled messages we've heard so far from our leaders. Please do not stand in front of almost a dozen people standing shoulder to shoulder, two rows deep, and tell us to keep our social distance and avoid large groups. We have other who questions. Some are not helpful at this time, like who to blame. The president has frankly made matters worse this week, referring to the coronavirus as the Chinese virus, as a foreign virus, and before that, as a hoax. That said, it does no good to spend our time criticizing our leaders for what they could have done earlier. Hindsight is only helpful going forward. There are lots and lots of questions and lots of not so good answers. Some answers aren't so good because they're true. Because the reality is that this public health threat is quite real. So too are the economic concerns. And some answers are bad 
because they are distractions and dead ends. You know how it is when we don't know the answer? We don't like not knowing the answers. So what do we do? We go looking for answers and we fill that unknown with half-truths, with easy answers, with detours, maybe a scapegoat, maybe even a conspiracy theory or two. That's not new. It's quite evident in this story from John's Gospel. It is the lectionary reading for today, the fourth Sunday in Lent. It is, appropriately enough, a story of healing and all the questions that that illness and that healing raise and all the not-so-good answers that people come up with to fill the unknown. Now, have you noticed how often the stories of Jesus healing someone are accompanied by controversy? Here in this story, Jesus is in trouble again for healing someone. The question that occupies our attention and frames the controversy is raised at the outset in verse 2 by Jesus' disciples who ask him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The man born blind was understood to be a sinner because of his condition. Now that seems harsh to us. We don't connect sin and suffering in such a simple cause and effect manner the way the ancients did. Our worldview is more scientific. Still, the story raises the age-old and timely question, especially now, about God and human suffering. It's a question that is often asked and all too often answered with absolutes. We see God as a loving, compassionate healer and we expect God to do something, something decisive and dramatic to heal every hurt. Or we see the suffering and we don't see God at all. We conclude that God either doesn't care or doesn't exist. A quote I found on a Good Friday worship bulletin answers the question of God and human suffering far better than such absolutes. As best as we can answer a question that has no easy answer. Paul Claudel wrote, Jesus did not come to explain suffering nor to take it away. He came to fill it with his presence. That, in a way, is what Jesus does here. He avoids the strict cause and effect argument, and Jesus instead speaks to the moment foreshadowing what will happen next. He answers the disciples' question, saying, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind that God's works might be revealed in him. Jesus then heals the man by making some mud and placing it on the man's eyes tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And then Jesus is gone. He doesn't return until the end of the story. A story which now shifts dramatically from a healing story to a kind of courtroom drama, if you will. We read in verse 13 a second point of controversy. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Therein lies the controversy. Jesus broke the law by working on the Sabbath. Maybe not so serious an offense in our eyes, but a major concern there and then. So first, the disciples see a case study in the connection between sin and suffering. Then the religious leaders see a rule broken and a cause for concern and controversy, and they both seem to be looking for and end up being comfortable with not so good answers. So much so that they miss the point. <laughs> this man who was blind now sees. He's been healed. 
The healing creates quite a stir when the man returns from the pool with his sight. They don't throw him a party. No, they have questions and they want answers. They ask him how this happened and the man tells them about the mud, about the man named Jesus, but that's not enough. The questioning continues and the man gives the same response as before, but this time he adds his own perspective. The Pharisees ask him what he thinks about this man who healed him, whether or not he is of God. And the man answers, he's a prophet. Well, that doesn't sit well with the religious authorities. So they question the witness again. This time they question whether or not this really is the man who was born blind. So they call his parents to vouch for him. The parents sidestep the question and distance themselves from the controversy. Way to go, Bob and Dad. So the religious leaders go back yet again to their questioning, their cross-examination. The man gives the same answer again and adds his own two cents as to whether or not this healer, this Jesus, is a sinner as they seem to suggest. I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. As you read through this story, you see the man's frustration build throughout the story. The religious leaders just don't get it. He began by answering their questions with the basic facts, but the more the interrogation goes on and on, the more they get distracted by the details, the more his convictions grow based on what he does know. The man born blind won't journey with the Pharisees down some religious rabbit trail. He won't be deterred or detoured. He sticks with what he knows saying with probably equal parts faith and frustration, one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. He reminds the religious authorities there that day and here today that this is a healing story. There's good news here. And actually, going back to all of our questions, there's some answers. Two, really both about who. Who does the healing and who is healed. Amidst the uncertainty of our days, we need to hold on to, like this man does, the one thing we know. We know the who. We know who is with us and who is for us. Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord, is a God of healing and a God of hope. We don't know the when or the what or the how relative to this pandemic. But we do know that Jesus is not some distant observer to all of this. He is with us. And He fills our suffering with His presence. And I don't mean that as some kind of simplistic band-aid. Whatever the question, Jesus is the answer. But I remind you that the truth we hold on to is the gospel truth that Jesus holds on to us. Not necessarily over or around our fear and our suffering, but through it. Through the pain and through this pandemic. Especially now, we must not see our faith as an escape, and certainly not as a reward for our righteousness or our rightness. Instead, we see it as a wellspring of hope, defiant, resilient hope. You know, my heart and my mind have been racing this past week, especially if I, as I've considered the challenge and opportunity to speak with you a word from God, a word rooted in God's Word. I mean, how appropriate is it that the lectionary text for this day is a feisty story of healing? So I've wrestled, but what can I say that might be helpful? 
What can I say that might help us get through this together? We are called together through this, although that togetherness takes on an altogether different kind of form. Johnny sent me a great text this week. It said, where two or more but less than ten are gathered together. Referencing Jesus' words, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. We are called together to hold each other up through this. Spiritually, not physically. We can do so with cards and calls, with errands run for and prayers prayed for the most vulnerable among us. That's the second who question that is answered in this healing story. I'll speak to that a little more in our prayer time. But what is it we are called to do in a time like this? My suggestion is that we are called to hold each other up with that defiant, confident hope that Jesus is among us, filling us, filling our suffering with His presence. That's what I hope to model during these difficult days. Defiant hopefulness. Now I'll admit that defiant hopefulness pairs well with my stubbornness. So just in case stubbornness might run in your family as well, I invite you in joining me to use your stubbornness in similar fashion. Grounded in grace and full of hope. Amen.
As we come before God in prayer this day, we invite your prayers and ask your prayers for us as a church, in particular as we begin this new format of seeking to lead worship on Sunday morning and you know, put it out there online for those of you to watch either live or later on YouTube. We invite your input. Uh, you can do so through Facebook if you wish. You can do so by emailing me, Dave Kivett at cfu.net. No spaces, no dots, no nothing. Just my name and cfu.net. We want to hear from you about how we might do this in a way that is most effective in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ during these difficult days. Uh, as we come before God in prayer, I uh, want to offer a word of advice, if I can, relative to the social distancing. We're hearing a lot of different things from a lot of different voices. Uh, I want to share one thing in particular that I pray will be helpful. The single best piece of advice I have heard recently is act like you have the virus. When it comes to social distancing, the single greatest thing you can do to love your neighbor is to be careful, to maintain that social distance. And I know that's hard. I, I'll give you an example. We have a Sunday evening program called Sunday Supper. Two of the chefs for Sunday Supper are from this congregation. Both of those chefs have had a case of the sniffles. Uh, we made the decision as much as we want to help those who are most vulnerable we don't want to risk anybody who has been having even the most minor of symptoms possibly passing on the virus to someone else so the Sunday supper ministry will not meet tonight and has been temporarily suspended based on the health of the cooks and volunteers we don't want to risk passing the virus on to anyone. So my encouragement to you is no matter how late you are to this conversation about how great this threat is, recognize that it is real and maintain the social distance that will keep you, your loved ones, your neighbors, and all of us as healthy as we possibly can. Mindful of that, we pray for the whole world. We continue our pattern during these days of praying for the world one nation at a time. Today we pray for the Central Asian nation of Kyrgyzstan. It is known as the Switzerland of Central Asia. A very mountainous and beautiful country. If you look it up, you'll notice I've got, a, in my opinion, a really cool flag. The flag is the top of a tent. Uh, a yurt as the tents they use in the nomadic parts of that country and so it's the top of a yurt tent uh, on a maroon background uh, we pray for them and we pray for countries like them that don't necessarily have the infrastructure around the world and where probably the cases of this pandemic virus are under reported uh, we pray in thanksgiving for their natural beauty and we pray uh, God's blessings upon them as they deal with the challenges faced in that nation, in particular in all nations of the world. A piece of good news in the, the church family, we welcome our newest member, Dan and Megan Butler, uh, have welcomed into the world their youngest daughter, Willa Fay. We are welcoming Willa Fay into this world and pray God's blessing upon her and her siblings and her parents mindful of those prayer concerns let us go to god in prayer O oh god of healing and hope we pray your blessing upon this world most especially we pray your blessing upon the most vulnerable we pray for those who have underlying conditions we pray for those most susceptible to this virus we pray especially for those involved in health care. We pray, O oh Lord, for those producers who are producing masks and protective equipment. 
We pray, O Lord, that we might meet the demand for more and more of those. We pray, O Lord, for the health of our health care workers. We pray for those who are administering tests. We pray for those who feel symptoms, but triage means they have to wait until more testing is available. We pray, O Lord, for public health workers, for the leaders as they seek to meet this challenge. We pray your blessing upon our president and all those in Congress, especially our Lord this weekend as they consider an economic package that will address the significant economic concerns, particularly on those, O oh Lord, who are most affected by this, those who depend on tips, those who are involved in the hospitality businesses and depend on the service sector of our economy. We pray, O oh Lord, your blessing on all those who are frightened. Speak to our fears, O oh Lord. Give us comfort and peace, hope and courage for the living of these days. We pray for the nation of Kyrgyzstan and its leadership, its peoples, and its abundant beauty and bounty. We pray your blessing, O Lord, on every land and every language. We pray during these days of uncertainty and fear and thanksgiving for the simple things we all too often take for granted. We pray in thanksgiving for the gift of new life as the butlers welcome their youngest daughter, Willa Fay, into this world. Be with her. Be with all the newborns. Help us all, O oh Lord, to value life, to value each other. We ask all these things. In the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to fill our suffering with his presence. And we do so praying the prayer he taught his followers to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, as a forgiven and a forgiving people, I charge you to keep the faith, knowing full well it is the faith that keeps us. I charge you also to hear and heed the words of the prophet Micah. God has shown you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God? So go now in peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen.